Welcome to Around the World in 80s Movies. My name is Vince Leo. I am the author of the film review website, Quipster.net. I've been doing film reviews since 1996. That's, wow, it's coming up on 25 years now. And you can read all of my written work there at that website, Quipster.net. I also have a link to another podcast that I do that has nearly 400 episodes you can listen to there that covers films that have come out within the last four to five years or so. It's called the Quipster Film Review Podcast. You can find that link at quipster.net. Today, I'm going to be getting into the first of another three-part series, kind of kicking off from Humanoids from the Deep, which was part of my last series. We have another humanoid nemesis, part fish, part human, for the next film I'm going to be talking about from 1989, the exact other end of the 1980s from Humanoids from the Deep. This one is called Leviathan, and that is going to be kicking off this three-part series looking at films featuring crews working underwater for most of them. All of them are science fiction films. Leviathan is an R-rated film. It does have strong creature violence, terror, disturbing images and language, including some sexual references and brief nudity. The runtime is an hour and 38 minutes. Peter Weller, Amanda Pays, Ernie Hudson, Richard Crenna, Hector Elizondo, Daniel Stern, Meg Foster, Michael Carmine, and Lisa Eilbacher are in the film. The director is George P. Cosmatos, and the screenplay credited to David Webb Peoples and Jeb Stewart. So the plot of Leviathan involves, it's set sometime in the near future, which is in the vibe of the science fiction genre, of course. We're following this crew of eight, and they're on their last few days of their stint working for this deep sea silver mining operation. It's off the coast of Florida, and there on the ocean floor, one of the crew members stumbles upon this wreck of a mysterious Russian ship that's emblazoned with the Russian word for Leviathan. And that ship has sunk, and they subsequently find out that it was probably ambushed by their own navy. They've looted the cargo that was on board the ship, and in so doing, the crew inadvertently brings back the remnants of this genetic experiment that's gone awry. And now, on their own vessel, something very dangerous has been set loose upon the underwater abode that is killing them in gruesome and nightmarish ways. Now, the origin of Leviathan involves David Webb Peoples. Shortly after he completed the screenplay to Blade Runner, David Webb Peoples began to write the screenplay to what would become Leviathan. His original script did differ from the plot I had just read in significant ways. This was, of course, in the early days of this property. Peoples had envisioned that his film would be very dark aesthetically, as well as thematically, but this film was going to involve no natural light. These characters were down there at the bottom of the ocean, 10,000 plus feet below the ocean where sunlight does not penetrate. And the suits that the humans would be wearing, they would give their faces some light, but everything around them would be pitch dark, just as it would be if you were going to be at the bottom of the ocean. Now, in People's original story, the characters would find this bottle with dried up insects inside. They would open it, these insects would come to life, and they would escape, and they would wreak havoc on this unsuspecting crew. And the creatures were not going to ever be a big monster. They were more like parasites that get into the humans and in fatal ways. Now, when James Cameron announced shortly after the release of Aliens that his next feature film was going to be a big-budget epic underwater adventure, that caused many film producers to scramble. They wanted to put together their own underwater terror properties that they could use to ride the anticipation for what would eventually become The Abyss. Now, People's script was already out there. That was one such script, and so it was immediately bought out by the producers of Die Hard, Lawrence and Charles Gordon, for their Gordon company. They hoped that they could tap into the anticipation for the abyss with something very similar of their own. So in 1987, the Gordon Company, they started shopping this project around with the people's script, and they eventually landed at Dino De Laurentiis' company, the De Laurentiis Entertainment Group, DEG. They were in dire straits, though, financially. They were only looking for sure things. And so they were sold that this dark horror thriller that took place underwater, that they could ride the hype that they felt would naturally exist for Cameron's next big feature, The Abyss. That seemed a very viable option to them at the time, better than what they had going. So DEG picked up Leviathan from the Gordon Company, and they all began the process of developing it as a commercial property. 
And DEG's first task was to corral an experienced director. Dino De Laurentiis assigned the task to Rambo First Blood Part 2's George P. Cosmatos, who was pulled from his costly DEG production called China Marines. DEG subsequently canceled that as being way too expensive and they weren't really guaranteed any returns. So they took Cosmatos off of that and put it on what they felt would be this sure thing. And Cosmatos liked the storyline when he heard it. He welcomed the move because there were no guns at all in this story. He didn't want to be pigeonholed like China Marines would have pretty much cemented into doing explosive action films the rest of his life because he had just done Rambo 2 and Cobra for Sylvester Stallone, and this was at least something different. After reading the script, Cosmatos, he brought in the that original screenwriter, David Webb Peoples, and he requested some major changes that he wanted to make to that script. Cosmatos wanted the story to conform to Cameron's prior film, Aliens. Peoples, he tried to make it work, but he found that the changes that Cosmatos wanted were very unreasonable, so he eventually abandoned the project, thinking he was not going to be able to produce what Cosmatos wanted. Now, to make things work to the director's satisfaction, the Gordons instead brought in the co-writer for Die Hard, Jeb Stewart, to overhaul the Peoples script. Now, for many years after the making of Leviathan, Peoples really disavowed Leviathan. He refused to even watch it. But one day, many years later, curiosity did get the better of him, so he gave it a go. And in watching the film for the first time, he came to the conclusion that his original Leviathan premise was actually very problematic, and he could see that he had made some mistakes in his storytelling. But he also saw that the filmmakers compounded on his own problems by adopting his mistakes, but then adding even more mistakes of their own. And given that the result was a substandard film that failed both critically and financially, Peoples says that Leviathan is not something that he's proud of having his name on and doesn't really talk about it that much when you discuss his career. Now, moving forward, DEG's financial difficulties did finally get the better of them. They had to abandon Leviathan shortly after developing the Jeb Stewart revised script. Luigi De Laurentiis, the older brother of Dino, and Luigi's son, Aurelio, the nephew of Dino, they were offered to take it up for their own production company, Filmauro, but they lacked the funds to really buy it outright. So to keep the film in family hands, DEG helped Filmauro to acquire the rights, and to finance it in exchange for obtaining the international distribution rights. So, Leviathan does mark Cosmatos' first film that he did in Italy since 1976's Cassandra Crossing. It was shot primarily in Cinecitta, which is the largest film studio in Europe based there in Rome. Additional shooting would also have to be done in Malta because they had some very large water tanks that could be used, approximately the size of 50 swimming pools. And these tanks allowed for tightly controlled underwater shooting while additional exterior ocean shoots would be filmed near Cancun, Mexico. Filmado hit turbulence, though, early on at Chinachita after signing an agreement with the crew's union to extend their workdays to include Saturdays. Many of the union members there felt that this was not negotiated with their consent, so they decided to go on strike, and they effectively shut down all filmmaking in Italy by doing so. So within a week, an agreement did get reached to satisfy all parties enough to continue. Now, other than that strike, early publicity on Leviathan was kept to a minimum. It was pretty much a secret project. They wanted to avoid competitors speeding up their own productions to get into theaters before Leviathan. So mum was the word. The labyrinthian set remained closed to the press as well as the public for the first two months of its production. They opened it up somewhat toward the last couple of weeks of the shoot. When the press was allowed in, they interviewed Cosmatos, of course, and he confessed that Leviathan, he felt, was the most difficult film that he had ever made in his career, and that there were times, in fact, that he felt that he was going to crack from the pressure of making it. The main difficulty for Cosmatos was his constant tug-of-war with his crew, especially the visual effects crew that was run by Stan Winston's studio. Stan Winston's studio, of course, they had a lot of clout in the industry. They were effectively able to pick their own projects. In fact, Stan Winston was sought by both the makers of Leviathan as well as James Cameron for The Abyss. Now, Winston would have preferred working with Cameron again. They had worked together for films like The Terminator and Aliens, but he had kind of a personal interest in making Leviathan instead because after completing his first directorial effort, Pumpkinhead, 
Winston wanted more opportunities to direct more films, so he chose Leviathan because Cosmatos promised Winston to take over the second unit director duties, and this film was scheduled to finish production much sooner than The Abyss, and that allowed Winston the opportunity to direct another project that he was offered called A Gnome Named Norm, which turned out to be not so great of a move for his career. In fact, I think it was the last film that he directed. Now, trying to envision what life might be like for humans who are living at the bottom of the deep sea, that required a lot of forethought. So Winston worked very closely with Cosmatos in looking at a collection of pictures that depicted deep sea fish life (laughs) in all their ugly glory, usually. And they also combined that with books on anatomy, human anatomy, and they drew up a lot of mock-ups for what they felt should be the look of their main creature, eventually combining many of those mock-ups into this unified idea of a hybridized monster. Now, as Winston also did effects for Alien and Aliens, he wanted to stray away from copycatting those films in their look and their design as much as he could. But Cosmatos, he really strongly felt that Winston should get as close as possible with what worked to those films. Cosmatos often argued about the look of Winston's creations. They bickered constantly, not only in front of the crew, but in front of the cast. And despite all of this bickering, all of the efforts, all of the sweat, blood, tears that they put into it, Winston and his staff, when the film finally did come out, they were surprised by just how little of their meticulous work was represented on the screen. It really had a creature that didn't have a lot of screen time. It's limited to small glimpses, even though they poured so much effort into sculpting just the right look and choreographing just the right movements for that creature. Now, Ron Cobb was brought in for production design, as he did so effectively as our designer for the aforementioned Alien, so really bringing in a lot of the makers here for what Cosmatos wanted to do. Cobb did find that Cosmatos was too overbearing to work for for long, especially because he insisted that the film follow almost to a T the formula of Alien. So Cobb didn't want anything to do with it anymore. He left the project during the late pre-production phase in favor of James Cameron's The Abyss. Bill Skinner took over where Ron Cobb left off. But they followed so much Cobb's original designs as much as possible that Cobb still received credit for his production design for Leviathan. Now, sets were enclosed, and they were also very claustrophobic. Very few of the cast or crew saw daylight most of the time, day after day during their shoot, which made it very hard to deal with in the long term. Boredom would often overtake these actors. They had a great deal of time sitting around waiting for the sets or waiting for the effects team to set up. This Italian film crew made it very challenging for Winston to convey precise instructions. They often required the effects team to have to draw pictures on paper of what they wanted from scene to scene. And and these Italians also had a very different work ethic than the American counterparts. They had copious amounts of red wine with their meals, and they occasionally did get the Hollywood crew to join in, which tended to make for a sometimes unproductive time on the set. The shoot was also contained to a tight six weeks, so when things seemed to be falling behind because of the delays, they continuously had to rearrange the schedule to the point where few knew what they were actually going to be working on from day to day. Now, the Winston Studios dive suits, they were designed by Steve Berg. They were a constant source for consternation. The actors complained persistently due to the prolonged discomfort that they felt within those suits. The suits were not only difficult to be in, but they were difficult to get on and off, so they would have to stay in these bulky and very heavy suits for hours with limited movement. They would frequently overheat in those suits, so they had to have cold air pumped in between takes, and they could not use their hands to hold things, so they would have to be spoon-fed when they needed to eat or drink while they were in those suits. I'm not even going to get into what they might have done for using the restroom, so... Now, there wasn't much of a stunt budget, so these actors were asked to perform many of their own stunts, including some involving being in water or around fire effects. Hector Elizondo, he said he came close to losing his life when a technician pressed the wrong button and this hydraulic that was attached above the head of his dive suit that he was wearing started to crush him, and luckily they figured out that issue in the nick of time. Amanda Pays stated that the physical demands were so difficult on the actors that if they ever made a Leviathan 2 and they wanted her to return, they would have to pay her a fortune. Now, the optical effects supervisor, Barry Nolan, he had experience simulating underwater action without actually being in the water using 
a combination of lighting and smoke and floating things in the air to try to mimic being submerged on the ocean floor. Actors in these deep sea suits, they did not have to perform underwater because of this clever dry for wet system. They're suspended on wires to try to mimic the buoyancy of underwater movement while the lighting is used to make the environs seem like the blue-green ocean, although technically I guess it should be pitch black at that depth, but there's some creative license there. Now, while the air was blown in to try to kick up these cut-up feathers to simulate plankton and other little things floating around them, you know, that allowed them to shoot in and around this massive wreck of the Leviathan without needing to build a gargantuan tank at great expense just for this one-off movie. And it also allowed them to avoid expensive diving equipment and the laborious training in scuba instruction for all of the cast and crew who could wear these fiberglass mock-up suits. These suits were made with football padding underneath and the helmets. They were bought out from the 1984 film, the sequel to 2001 A Space Odyssey called 2010. And to get the feeling of the buoyancy of being at the bottom of the ocean and also the weight of these suits, the dry for wet sequences were shot at 48 frames per second. And that gave the appearance of very slow movements when played at the standard 24 frames per second for motion pictures. The problem, though, was that they found that the feathers that they wanted to use to resemble plankton, they tended to drop straight down instead of swirl in the air. And they covered the sand on the ground so it looked like they were just piling up on the feet. Nick Alder, who won an Academy Award for his work on Alien, he came up with this alternate solution. It involved candelati, which were these fireworks that were originally produced for cooking while camping. And this process had also been used by Italian filmmakers for many years to simulate snow. So they would utilize these slow burning candles. They were wrapped in paper and solid alcohol and they would blow out the smoldering flame and that produced fine white ash flakes that floated in the air for several minutes. They would swirl around anytime somebody moved past and it eventually evaporated when it hit the floor. So it was very perfect for what they were trying to do. Now, the ocean floor, that was expensive, so they didn't want it piled on with feathers. You know, 200 tons of sand were shipped in from an Italian beach for this shoot, so they wanted to utilize that. Bellows were put into the feet of their suits so that when the actors stepped down on those bellows, it would puff up sand just like the sand that would be kicked up when they stepped on the bottom of the ocean. Now, Leviathan, for better or worse... It's exactly what Cosmatos wanted it to be, which was an alien clone. There's a dash here and there of John Carpenter's The Thing. If you like The Thing, you'll definitely find a lot that you'll recognize here. If you mix those with a a recurring Pepsi commercial, I mean, the product placement for that soft drink is off the charts in Leviathan. It substitutes space for the deep sea here, the genetic experimentation instead of an alien infestation. But it's pretty much the same thing that you've seen before in space, but underwater here. Now we have the same motley crew of company men, of company women, the same gory bodily manifestations, the same isolated labyrinthine set design, the same hybridized monster, the same the same underlying anti-corporation commentary. I mean, it's all in there. It is every bit as derivative as I'm making it sound. So even with emulating the formula of these better films and getting the jump on the abyss, though, Leviathan was, in the end, a box office failure. I mentioned that earlier. At the time of its release, it only earned $15 million of its $25 million budget back in the United States. And part of this could be attributed to being beat to the punch by another film that basically did the same thing as them in many respects. That was called Deep Star Six, and it came out in January, just a couple of months before the release of Leviathan. So people were not wanting to come back for another round, especially since Deep Star Six was not very well regarded by critics or fans. And Leviathan also happened to be lost in anticipation for that higher profile James Cameron film, The Abyss, that would come out later the same year. This film is also probably too disgusting for most mainstream audiences. It has very grotesque body transformations, wounds that open up to reveal sharp and gnarly fangs within them, and this monster that consists of torsos and limbs and faces of the victims that it all fuses up into one entity. It's kind of like the least appealing science fiction horror film around. If you're not inured to that sort of thing visually, if you're turned off by body horror, I definitely don't think you're going to get a lot here that you want to see. But of course, if you do like that sort of thing, I guess you'll get what you like. Now, the direction here by George Picasmatos 
I do think that he shows some poor instincts with this kind of material. I do like him in other films, but here I feel he just got lost. I mean, Cosmatos himself would often admit while he was on the set that he was not really sure what he was doing, especially when it came to the technical side of the filmmaking, which most of this film is kind of a technical way to construct a movie. So even with his arguments on making sure that they follow the path of Alien, he pretty much let the effects and the production teams do their own thing with a degree of increased autonomy on how to achieve that end. As long as the end result was what he wanted, he was happy with whatever they needed to do to make that happen. So instead of trying to play for this genuinely frightening motion picture here, he instead played up a lot of camp, very half-heartedly, barf-inducing <laughs> ick factor to get over the story and character issues that were there in the script. This motley cast of characters is rife with the typical stereotypes that you can imagine. At no time does this, you know, actually very fine ensemble of actors exhibit the kind of camaraderie that you would expect from a tight-knit crew who've been living in close quarters with only each other to talk to for about 12 weeks. And it's not that we expect necessarily, you know, strong Academy Award-worthy performances given that they had such horrendous half-jokey lines to spew in the middle of what's supposed to be this dark and sinister and gory excursion, but none of them really strike a resonant chord throughout. They have little moments here and there, but for the most part, it's kind of all awash. Even the underutilized Hector Alizondo, who I enjoy in almost any film, I don't think he's used as well as he could here. Now, Ernie Hudson, he delivers probably the most one-liners during these times of abject horror. It really takes you out of the morbid tone of the film time and again, including especially toward the end when he quips about, oh, what a bad day he's having. So... This movie doesn't take itself seriously really at all, even though it plays out mostly serious for about 80% of the runtime. Hudson did join the cast because he didn't have to audition. He wanted to bring his family to see Rome and Malta. It's kind of like an extended vacation for all of them. You know, he was not a swimmer, though. That was kind of the downside. So a lot of the scenes that were meant to show him in the water just show him just getting out of it. And later on, he would uh, talk about in interviews that he thinks part of the reason why this film was not well regarded by the public or the critics ties in very much with his character's demise at the climax of this film, which was completely unnecessary in his opinion, and as well as the opinion of many others that he saw the film with. Cosmatos did put his character's death because he felt that they needed a big surprise at the end. But by that point, Hudson felt that, you know, the black guy dying in a horror film, that was the cliche. Black people almost never made it through a horror movie. So especially the way that he dies randomly by this shark that happens to be in the area instead of by the main nemesis, it would have been a much bigger surprise if his character survived, Hudson argues. So now, meanwhile, Daniel Stern plays the most loathsome of the, the comic relief characters of them all. He's kind of this beyond belief pervert named Six Pack. I don't know why the name Six Pack, it's never really explained. Maybe he likes to drink beer or something, but no one calls him anything else but Six Pack in this movie. The corporation themselves printed Six Pack on his diving suit instead of his real name like everybody else, which is kind of a quandary. This character would have been fired from just about any job for the kind of sexual harassment that he perpetuates every single time that he's in the room with any woman. And poor Amanda Pays, also known as Mrs. Corbin Burnson, she was married to Corbin during this time and still is to this day, she has to disrobe to her undergarments several times for no other reason than for pure audience titillation. Peter Weller here, working with Cosmatos, he'd worked with him before in a movie called Of Unknown Origin. Cosmatos, very high on that film. He felt that Of Unknown Origin was one of his best films, and Peter Weller gave one of the best performances that he had in any one of his films. So he thought this was the strongest actor that he had worked with. He wanted to get him on board, and he also liked Richard Crenna from Rambo First Blood Part Two. so he was also cast. And Weller can play a very convincing oddball in his films. He doesn't really fit in here, I do think, as the steely and charismatic chief who's supposed to represent the rational hero here. He's wisecracking instead of emoting at the tensest of moments. And that's really one of my main beasts for this film. It's like a movie that you're supposed to be invested in, but it never gives you the adequate suspense. It doesn't give you the characters that are even in tune with what's going on for the most part. So the only thing that I remembered, I saw this movie back in 1990. So when it first hit home video. And the one thing that kind of lasted from the film 
was that the friend that I saw it with, we would refer to the sickly feeling that we had after eating bad food as, oh, I have the Leviathan feeling, you know, jokingly. I really can't remember if that reference had been due to the horrific nausea that was shared among the film's characters who were mutating internally and the, and the look on their faces as if they had bad food like we did, or maybe it was because of the nauseous result of actually watching this movie that we found disgusting. But I can tell you in this long and coming rewatch here for the purpose of this review that the answer does work for both. I think the film's climax and the ending are the worst aspects of this film. This film is really average to below average in my estimation for the most part, but the final half hour features such absurd developments. They ignore primary dangers like oxygen deprivation, like decompression sickness. It even tosses in that shark attack right there to up the ante as if having this massive and vomitous manfish monstrosity that could potentially infect and wipe out the human race if it were on the surface were not formidable or scary enough to be the main villain. We have to have this shark randomly appear, a jump shot with an explosive, a one-liner that rips off Jaws, uh, a literal punchline at the end of the movie, or just one more kick to the gut for those few movie fans, I think, that are left who have to manage to endure in what here is little more than a rotting dish of cinematic Samogundi. So, like its main monster, I think Leviathan is repulsive, it's mongrelized fusing of the bodies of works of several other far more appealing entities, and I think it's just as hard to look at from a visual standpoint as it is hard to stomach in its action. So this is a movie that I know has its fans, and I know that some of you listening right now are probably big fans of Leviathan. Why would you listen to a half hour of me talking about it unless you felt some affection for it? But for me, this is not one of those movies that I think very highly of. So I'm not somebody who would recommend it to most people, except for people who are really into body horror and really are kind of inured to the kind of schlock that rips off so many other sci-fi premises. In fact, if you've watched the Sci-Fi Channel and all of these movies that have a jokey attitude and really rip off a, about a dozen other sci-fi films, I think you're probably the audience for this. But for most film goers, I do think that Leviathan is not going to be a very great time at the movies. And everybody who made this movie pretty much thinks the same thing in terms of feeling that they were making a bad movie. So the best I'm going to give, the very best, is it's kind of a borderline between one and a half and two stars. But because I've seen it multiple times, I'll give it the higher of the two grades at two stars out of four. Two stars on my scale means that it's lacking something vital that would keep it from being a movie that I could recommend to enough people to give it kind of a pass. And what is really missing here is inspiration. They started this film by trying to rip off a movie before it came out, and they ended up ripping off a bunch of movies that had already come out in order to do that. And what we have left here is kind of a contempt for the audience who is ravenous for a certain kind of movie, and they're just going to throw in a checklist of things that worked before but worked very much better in other movies, especially of the 1980s. So two stars out of four is the very best I can give Leviathan. Now, obviously, you're going to have your own thoughts on Leviathan. If you're somebody who champions this movie for any reason, if you think that this movie should be regarded better or on the same level as Alien or Aliens or The Thing or even the other films that came out around the same time you can write to me you can find my contact information all at my website instagram twitter feed facebook page email i do think is the best way to get in touch with me you can find that contact information at quipster.net q-w-i-p-s-t-e-r.net now if you know what three movies came out theatrically in 1989 that were really in the same vibe actually you could mention five or six movies that all had the same premise this year but the three main ones are the ones I'm going to be talking about here. So I'm going to get into the one I've actually mentioned in this very review, Deep Star 6, which came out before Leviathan, a couple months before. That will be the review I do next. So if you haven't seen Deep Star 6, it actually will be a first-time watch for me. Even though I've seen Leviathan, I've seen The Abyss many, many times, Deep Star 6 will be the first time that I watch it for next week's episode. So I hope that you'll check it out. Not necessarily well-regarded, but I'm going to keep an open mind as I get into it, and we'll see if it's at least as good or as bad <laughs> as Leviathan. And you'll hear about that on the next episode. Until next time, thank you so much for listening and joining me on this trip around the world in 80s movies. Uh-huh.